Hello, everyone. Welcome to 2-on-1's training, or excuse me, the 2-on-1 training presented by Call for Justice on Bankruptcy. Today, our speaker is, oh, my name is Ellie Krug, the Executive Director of Call for Justice. Today, our speaker is James Brandt. He's an attorney with the Fredrickson and Byron Law Firm in downtown Minneapolis. James is a graduate of Valparaiso University, from which he graduated summa cum laude and also uh, a law school graduate uh, of, from the University of Chicago Law School, which I said yesterday was in the top five law schools in the country. Um, James represents and advises small and large businesses, commercial lenders, and individuals in the area of corporate restructuring, debtor-creditor law, bankruptcy, commercial litigation, and related matters. He is also an adjunct professor at the University of Minnesota Law School, where he teaches in the law clinic. So he teaches law students about bankruptcy law, which, trust me, is no simple or easy task. So without any further ado, help me welcome James Brand, please. Well, thank you. Um, and it's really that last part of my bio that is most applicable today. And that's, um, I work in the bankruptcy clinic at the University of Minnesota Law School. And that's one of the places somebody who calls you could end up, depending on their situation and what route they take. We take all of our clients through VLN. So the first call that you'd make would be to VLN. There's a screening process involved, and then it gets put out to a number of different uh, venues to be taken up by an attorney. And the, the University of Minnesota is one of those. And we have students that are second or third year law students. We have between eight and 10 each year in our clinic. And then they take um, these representations. Um, I supervise that, have a classroom component where we talk about the substantive law and then they wade into it and represent these clients through uh, the process that we'll talk about today. So we're really a team here. Um, you're on the front end, you're the first contact and depending on um, the issues that you can spot and the places you can refer them to, it may end up uh, a, a case that I work on. So um, I'm here today to give you a crash course in bankruptcy to make that teamwork work so that you can spot these issues, answer questions that you have, um, and really we're just going to have some fun because bankruptcy is fascinating, let me tell you. <laughs> I only got three laughs out of that. <laughs> it's funny, it's, it's interesting stuff, and I'll tell you why. Because when there's not enough money to go around, people get excited. <laughs> it's true. I mean, if the whole reason that you're in a bankruptcy is there's not enough money to go around. Uh, you've, the person has incurred more than they can pay back as the general scenario. There are other reasons when one might use a bankruptcy, and we'll talk about those today. Um, but first, we're going to start by talking about what a bankruptcy is, because it really encapsulates a lot of different avenues. There are three main types of bankruptcy two that we're going to spend a lot of time on today, one that we're going to spend the most of the time on, um, and then one that you've probably read about most in the papers. Um, so the three that we'll talk about are Chapter 7, a Chapter 11, and a Chapter 13. And those are just different chapters of the statute that Congress passed. It's Title 11. You, know, there's, you go to a, a law library and you'll see a big rack of the United States Code, and this is just one chapter of that, or one title of that, broken up into chapters. Chapter 7 is the one we'll talk about most today that deals with a liquidation. That's where um, a person walks into a bankruptcy, starts a bankruptcy case, and they will have to go through a process where they have to disclose all of their assets, all of their liabilities. And then the deal is if they put all that stuff out on the table, if they fully disclose everything, and um, the, they turn over all non-exempt assets, then they get a discharge of most of their debts. And we'll talk about each of those components, but that's the rough framework. You bring in what you have, a uh, nice image is, you've got a knapsack on your back with all your stuff in it, and thank you. Thank you, Rose. And your deal is you have to walk into court, and you have to set it out on the table and say, well, this is what I have. I have uh, four pairs of shoes, I have a car, I have this house, or I have this apartment lease, and I owe this and that and the other. And there's a process of sorting through all your stuff, determining is it exempt, is it not. If it's not exempt, it can be sold. That money is then collected and distributed to everybody who's made a claim against you. That's the rough, rough view of what a Chapter 7 is. 
Yeah. Chapter seven just for individuals? It is not. It is also for, it's, it can be for companies as well. There are limitations. So for example, a bank can't file a chapter seven, but um, in general, it's for any, anything and anybody. The, the principle there is that it's a liquidation. It's whatever you have goes in. Um, interestingly, um, a company doesn't get a discharge at the end of it. So there's a, a, a main difference as to you know, what happens when a company goes in. But it's the main one that individuals use, Chapter 7. Contrast that to a Chapter 11, which maybe a, companies that you might read about in the paper would have. And that's a reorganization where they go into court and use the court process to restructure their debts to then keep going as a business. Um, that's something that we're not going to talk about today. Uh, it uses a lot of the same principles. So um, what you're learning about here will help you when you're reading the paper uh, and try to explain to your kid what the heck it means that you know, the airline filed for bankruptcy and how are they still flying up there, you know, that, those types of things. And it's part of what's important in our society to understand these. Uh, but we'll not touch much on that today. But a chapter 13 is also for individuals. And that is very similar to an 11 in a lot of ways because it's a reorganization of debts rather than a liquidation of assets. And what that means is you're walking into court and instead of taking your knapsack, dumping it out on the table, talking about your four shoes, um, you instead get to keep your stuff but promise to pay a portion of your income over the next three to five years, your disposable income to pay off your creditors. Now, it's not going to be full payment. I mean, that's the point. That's why we're in a bankruptcy. It's going to be a partial. Um, it's going to be what it, really what you're doing is you're divvying up, according to a statutory scheme, whatever disposable income you have for that time period. So even just the way that I discussed these and described them, your minds are probably clicking away already about when it would make sense for someone to go one direction or another. Um, and we'll hit those hard as we go along because that's the key part of issue spotting is figuring out, okay, some agencies can handle, most, it's sevens are what um, is kind of the bread and butter of a consumer world. Um, Thirteens are much more complicated. Um, I'm not aware of any volunteer organizations that do a full 13 for people. So I want you to be aware of that and we'll talk kind of about the cost structure too as we get into this. But just to give you an idea about what this means in Minnesota, there were roughly 17,000 cases, bankruptcy cases filed in Minnesota last year, in the calendar year. 14,000 of those were a chapter seven. So they're by far the most common. About 2,800 were um, a chapter 13. So that's the second most common, but much less common. And then just a handful of others. Um, the chapter 11s I talked about, and there's actually a chapter 12 too, uh, and that's for family farmers. Um, so it's like an 11, but a little different. And believe it or not, just to make it more confusing, there's a chapter 9 for municipalities and government units, but we don't, haven't had one of those here in Minnesota, so we're not California, thankfully. Um, so that's the breakdown. Chapter 7s are the most common. That's what you'll get calls about the most. That's what we're going to talk about the most today. And of course, questions as they come up, let's talk. So, Okay, so that's what a bankruptcy is. What does it require? Well, I've already talked about walking in with your knapsack, spreading it out on the table, full disclosure. That's the biggest thing. You know, you're, you have to describe everything. People don't like that. They say, well, do I really have to write this down? Yeah, well, you do. You know, you have to notify all of your creditors. That's the, that's the point here. Second is there's a filing fee involved. Uh, it's 306 bucks for a Chapter 7. The court will waive that. There's an application process if the person doesn't have the money and can't get the money. Um, the cases that I handle through the clinic, I'd say about 75% of them get the fee waived. And these are people who are uh, really hard up. So it's, if they've had the money to pay for a lawyer, the court's not going to waive the filing fee. And I'll tell you why. Um, because a lawyer is just one part of the system for this, for doing a bankruptcy. The other part of the system is the court itself. And there's somebody called a trustee, who's a private individual who's just been appointed to be on a panel. They get a random draw. Whenever a bankruptcy case is filed, one gets randomly assigned to this panel of trustees. This is a, uh, most of them are attorneys. They don't have to be, it could be an accountant. Um, anybody else who um, is um, interesting enough to love bankruptcy, maybe is the way to say it. Um, but these are people who, their job is 
to look at all the paperwork that gets filed, figure out if there are any exempt assets, deal with them, and then distribute it to creditors. That's what they have to do. Um, on the typical case that doesn't have any assets, they still have to go through all that. They still have to put the debtor under oath and do a diligent inquiry, and they get paid $60 for doing that. And that $60 comes out of the filing fee. If there's no filing fee, if the filing fee is waived, they work for free. Um, so the court doesn't like to impose that on a private individual who's on this panel unless you know, there's a good reason. And that good reason would be the person just doesn't have the money and can't get the money. Now, depending on the cycle of when during the year you file, think about things like tax refunds. Springtime, a lot of people that are um, kind of on the edge of poverty handle a tax refund kind of like a savings account. Um, it kind of gets racked up during the year and then there's a payday. 3,000 bucks, you know, come March, April, May. Um, so that, courts will look at that too in determining, okay, well, you can, you can, if you're filing your case in April, yes, you can use some of your filing fee to, or some of your refund to pay the filing fee. Those are the practical things that the court looks at. Um, another thing you have to do when you enter the bankruptcy procedure, if you're trying to file a Chapter 7, you have to fill out something called a means test. And what this does is it tests whether, I guess the way to say it is Congress doesn't want people who can afford to pay back their debts to get a free ride. So they devised uh, a questionnaire that tries to determine, tries to get at that question of do you really have, can you pay back a meaningful portion of your debts? And the way they did it is to say, first of all, first cut, if you make at or below the median income, in your state, you pass. You, you're, you're eligible to file a Chapter 7. And actually, that's kind of a lot of money. In Minnesota, it's $84,000, I think, for a family of four is the median. Um, so lots of people, most, the, the vast majority of people who are filing for bankruptcy fall with underneath that median and therefore pass the test. So you don't have to worry anymore about it. It's more complicated if they're above the median. Then they have to go through what's really a really nasty tax return. That's kind of how I think of it. it. You have to list your income. You have to list your expenses. You have to list um, you know, how you have to categorize them. And then you have to compare them against IRS guidelines for um, you know, what, what kind of expenses are appropriate. And to determine whether you have enough disposable income to um, make you not pass the means test. Well, what does that mean, not passing the means test? All that means is you are routed into a Chapter 13. It's, they've determined you may have enough to pay back your debts, so you should be pushed into a Chapter 13. Not automatically. You have the ability to say there are extenuating circumstances or some reason why, even though this test I was triggered here, I can still do a 7. But generally, that's the routing mechanism. Most people going in pass the test and can take a 7 if they want it. That's kind of the, the takeaway. Somebody also needs to have credit counseling before they come in. So one of the first calls that they'll make when they, you're referring them to a lawyer, um, the lawyer will refer them to an agency that does credit counseling. Um, at the clinic, we refer people to Lutheran Social Services. They do a good job, they're reasonably priced, and they do it for free if the person qualifies. Um, having a lawyer who's working for free automatically qualifies them. So everybody through the clinic gets it for free. Otherwise, I think, I think it's maybe 70 bucks, um, it, and there are two components. There's a the before you file and an after you file piece, um, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a, an outlay at the front end before you can even go in the door. And then the last thing is you have significant responsibilities and disclosures to go through, and that's the, that's the filling out the forms. The forms add up to about 40 to 50 pages total to do a bankruptcy form. And it's, it's the petition, it's all of these schedules, and it's disclosure of um, all of your income for the last several years, transfers you've made, gifts you've made, um, you know, anything that, and here's the reason, it's so that the trustee can quickly identify, are there any non-exempt assets to collect for creditors? Well, I'm about to move on to my next thing, which is why would you ever do this? Um, but before I do, I've realized I've been throwing around this term of exempt property and non-exempt property. Um, and let's stop and make sure we understand what that is. 
um, and talk about it. You may have talked about it in, I don't know if you've had people talk about collections or garnishment. Um, it's the same concept that would have been talked about in that scenario, and here's why. Because we have it under state law. So under Minnesota law, outside of bankruptcy, there's such a thing as exempt property. Well, what does that mean? It means the sheriff can't seize it. Now, why would the sheriff take your property? What, you, what have you ever done to the sheriff? You know, well, the sheriff is used as a collection tool. Um, if somebody owes you money, how do you get it back? You don't break their kneecaps. We don't do that. You know, that that's not acceptable. What you do is you go to court, and you get a judgment. And then what? Well, you show the person the judgment. You say, aha, I have a judgment. You have to pay me now. No, they still don't pay you. What do you do next? You break their knee. No, you don't break their kneecaps. You have a judgment. You have to use these legal mechanisms to have the sheriff go collect property. Or you have to use these processes to have the bank freeze their bank account. Um, there are, it's a very difficult process to collect the money. So that's what the creditor is doing on the one hand. Well, if you're the person that's trying to be collected from, there are protections against what the sheriff can take from you. And those are called exemptions. And that's actually in the Minnesota Constitution. The Minnesota Constitution not only says there shall be no debtor prison, believe it or not, it's in the Constitution. You can't have a debtor's prison here in Minnesota. But it says there shall be a reasonable amount of property that's exempt from process, which means the sheriff can't take a base amount. And then it leaves it to the legislature to figure out what that is. And the legislature has done that. There's a, a long list of property in Minnesota outside of the bankruptcy contest, context that is not, that the, the sheriff can't seize. Anybody guess what some of that is? Your house? Um, to some extent, yes. You, the house is protected. And in Minnesota, it's a, to a, a huge amount. So you can protect, I think it's currently $360,000 of equity in, a, in your homestead. Yeah. Um, your actual physical land that the house might be on, or just land that you own? Um, if it's your homestead, yes, or if it's farming property, yes. Yeah, but if, but if you have a vacation house, that's not protected. Retirement? That's right, yep. And that's actually through, uh, depending on the type of retirement process, uh, if it's through the, if it's a um, 401k versus um, if it's a state benefit, those are different, but yeah, that's great. That's one of the important things, and think about that. Think about why. Because if people lose their retirement savings, what's going to happen when they get old? Then society has to pay for taking care of them. So not only is it looking out for individuals to say, we don't want the sheriff to take this and that and the other, but it's also thinking, okay, as a society, what do we want? How do we want people to live? Do we want, do we want to make it so that they can be tossed out on the doorstep when they're 80 years old, not able to work anymore? And so we've decided, no, these certain things should be exempt. Well, what you didn't guess... And I'm very disappointed. I thought you were better students. Than this, but the family Bible is exempt. Wow. <laughs> your burial plot is exempt. Oh. Yeah. Um, your library? Not, not the East Lake Library, you know, not, not your neighborhood library, but your actual, your personal library. Um, musical instruments? Anybody? So what I can tell you is that these laws have been accumulated over time. So since Minnesota was its inception as a state, since the Constitution of Minnesota said there have to be exemptions, legislature has dutifully gone about figuring out what it thought was important for people to have. What about life insurance? Yes, life insurance benefits are to a certain extent. Um, and remember, or life insurance can be structured different ways. It can be structured... Uh, term life insurance is just where you pay each year and you're covered in case something terrible happens. You can also have some life insurance that's kind of like a piggy bank where you can, loan, you can get a loan against it. It has a cash value. Um, that's only protected to a certain extent. So you can't hide your money there is the point. But you could buy some very expensive you know, books or... <laughs> Fantastic! Everybody, a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> and here's why. Because... Um, the court has determined that the musical instrument one that I just talked about is unconstitutional because it doesn't have a dollar limit. Because somebody in a bankruptcy case had a really expensive, no, they had a violin and it was, uns it was unsure how expensive it was. But the court said, look, 
the Constitution said you shall make these exemptions in a reasonable amount by just exempting musical instruments without a dollar limit. It could be a Stradivarius that's worth $3, $3 million. Can't do it. So they said it was unconstitutional. We're in this limbo land now because the legislature hasn't fixed it. So you're left with a puzzle every time you're going to exempt a musical instrument. Well, is somebody going to challenge this? That's what happens in the law. It's not black and white. There are a lot of things to argue about, but fantastic point. And if people do that, if they hide their assets, if they shift their assets in anticipation of bankruptcy or because their creditors are chasing them, um, there can be some problems. Um, the creditors or the bankruptcy trustee can sue under a theory called fraudulent transfer to say you were hiding your assets or you were doing this just to delay, hinder, or defraud your creditors. And it causes all sorts of problems. So, James, James, could they also get criminally prosecuted? Because don't they have to sign on the bankruptcy form under pains and penalties of perjury? This yes. is true. And that's a great da -da -da point. But if they disclose stuff. the bad things they've done, then they're not going to perjure themselves. So there you're in a little catch-22. Do I tell the trustee everything that I hid? Or do I take the risk? You just don't do it in the first place. That's, what, you know, that's the outcome. <laughs> but yeah, and that's the idea of these disclosures. These are under penalty of perjury, and there are bankruptcy or criminal statutes. Uh, Denny Hecker is in the clink because of non-disclosure and hiding assets. Okay, so that's what... Oh, you know, I, I was too glib. There are valuable exemptions as well. Personal goods, about $10,000 worth of uh, your motor vehicle. Uh, I think it's about 4600 right now that is the value of a car that you can exempt. Um, and then here's a really important one. All public assistance and the wages of somebody who is a recipient of relief based on need. So if you are a person who receives relief based on need and you have a job, your wages from that job cannot be garnished. Okay, that's very important for this reason. There's a concept that we talk about in this arena called being judgment proof. That means that you kind of have insect, let's talk about it like insect repellent. You've got a can of off and you spray it on yourself, a mosquito comes by, oh, can't get me, I've got my insect repellent on. Well, I have judgment repellent. Spray that on and nobody, the sheriff comes up with the judgment and it bounces right off. You can't get close. You know, that's wrong. It should be a force field. How's that? Superpowers. My kids are really into superheroes. So I can just imagine them walking around with this, you know, glowing um, little barrier around them of judgment proof. Nobody can touch you with a judgment. That just means that a judgment doesn't have the effect that the person wants it to have because they use the judgment to say, go get those wages. Oh, can't. Those are exempt. Go get that car. Oh, can't. Uh, no, only have one car and so less than the 4,600. Yeah. Does that mean that the person that's on public benefit could not file Chapter 13? It does not mean that. Um, where I'm, what I'm going with this is they may not need to. Okay. So somebody who's judgment proof under state law, just la-di-da right now, creditors can't do much to them. It's, it's a hassle, and we'll talk about other reasons to file in, in, in a little bit. But Because you have to be diligent about saying I'm judgment proof. Um, you have to put out your force field. Whenever somebody f issues a garnishment, you have to say, uh-uh. Um, so and if you forget, you slip up. Or even you don't. Somebody does that to your bank account. It gets frozen while it gets sorted out, whether you have exemptions. Bank isn't, doesn't like that. They charge you fees. You know, so it's not something that... It's not a wonderful way to live, being judgment proof, but it's protection and it suggests that you may not need this bankruptcy. A big point for screening that we'll talk about as we go along. James, could I interrupt real Please. quickly? Remember our training from Martha Delaney with Volunteer Lawyers Network where she came in and talked about, you know, the um, lawsuit answering line that they set up and at that time she was uh, against um, lawsuits were arising from bad debts and at that time she talked about garnishments and how some monies can't be garnished if you're getting Social Security disability or Social Security or um, unemployment insurance, things of that. So, so just to make the point to double back, this is really along the same line to what James is talking about. It's that same kind of money that can't be garnished. Then the question I have for you is, you talked about judgment proof where somebody doesn't have any assets 
you know, and and or and and has um, exempt money in their as far as their income. What about somebody who has no assets but is only making minimum wage, which I think may be a lot of the callers that that you know that we get here. So they've got some money coming in. Mm -hmm. It's you know at from it's not exempt money, but they have so much high in debt that you know they've racked up through credit card to what el whatever. Would those people also not be deemed judgment proof in that sense? Um, they're only judgment proof if um, all of what they have is exempt. That's kind of what, what the colloquial term for it means. Here in your scenario, if they're making just minimum wage. You may remember from the garnishment talk, um, there's a limit. To, you can only garnish above a certain amount, and it's pegged at right about minimum wage. So they should be protected in that scenario, but they have to go through the process of, of claiming that exemption. If, they have, if they're making more than minimum wage and they're not receiving public benefits, um, that's the perfect person to be considering for referral to a bankruptcy source because they have something to protect. Remember what a Chapter 7 does. You walk in with your knapsack, you dump it out on the table. You, that's it. You're not on the hook for your future income. What you make after you filed the case, everything you make going forward is yours. Your creditors get to fight out among what's non-exempt among your assets. But what you make going forward is yours. That's the big concern and why some people get routed to a Chapter 13 because if they're making $150,000 a year, that seems really unfair to be able to say, oh, I, I only have a couple things right now. Go ahead, fight it out, and then laugh as you walk off with your you know, big paycheck going forward. Those are the scenarios where Congress said, no, if you can afford to pay out of your, your future income, we want to make you, make you do that. Um, so that's the, the big division between a 7 and a 13 is, okay, are you, is it a backwards looking or is it forwards looking? Is it settling out the scores with what you have or is it keeping what you have but settling out with your income over the next three to five years? Yeah. And a judgment remains in effect for like 10 years, right? So And can be renewed. Yeah, so even if the person's judgment proof at this point in time that judgment can come back and haunt them Absolutely. in the future. Absolutely. Yep. That's totally right. And it's a good point because um, it not only stays around and can have consequences later if they do get assets, but as I mentioned, you're constantly fighting off. So it has you know, mental health issues of just feeling under siege. Um, there are other reasons to deal with it, as well as... Um, when you, well, we'll get there in a second. So the second thing with exemption laws are that um, they have a place in bankruptcy too. We were talking about exemptions to do this issue of are you judgment proof? Well, they matter, as I remember, remember I said, you dump your stuff out on the table, you figure out what's not exempt. Well, you get to keep what's exempt and you can choose. You have more options in a bankruptcy than you would outside of a bankruptcy. Outside of a bankruptcy, we have the Minnesota exemptions telling the sheriff what they can and can't do. Inside the bankruptcy, the trustee uses, you get to choose whether the trustee will either use the Minnesota ones to make it the determination or uh, a separate set of federal bankruptcy exemptions that are kind of a separate thing that can be um, more advantageous for people. And they generally are more advantageous, except in the case where there's a house involved, because the federal exemption is about $20,000 rather than three hundred and sixty. dollars So um, in cases where there's no homestead involved with significant equity, then um, people generally, uh, it's beneficial to choose um, a federal exemption. And that's not important for your screening, because that, you know, that determination of which exemptions to use is a, something that they'd need legal counsel to do. But it's good to know the options where if somebody's saying, I really need to, I have a lot of equity in my house. Well, there are exemptions that can help protect that. If they don't have that, there are more flexible exemptions that can um, be used to cover other assets. Okay, so now we know um, 
I think talking about the exemptions, we're on the same page with what those mean, how they affect what a Chapter 7 is. Let's talk about why you'd ever want to file for bankruptcy. We've seen what, what you have to do, what you have to bring. If you're a Chapter 7, you have to give up all your non-exempt assets. You have to go through this painful process of disclosing all this information, go through a means test, go through, um, you know, pay a filing fee, go through credit counseling, um, possibly pay a lawyer if, you can't, if you're not able to get free services. So why would you do it? Well, there are three things for me that come to mind. Happy to hear if you've had callers that have other experiences we can talk through. But first is if the state exemptions aren't enough. That's kind of the unsaid result of what we were talking about. If you're not judgment proof, that's a great reason to file. If you have assets that cannot be protected through, for example, someone's going to start seizing your wages. You, you have a good job. Well, you have a good job, but you're still below the median income. You're a perfect candidate for a Chapter 7 because you have something to protect. You're going to have to put your knapsack on the table, give away, or have the non-exempt assets sold to, for creditors, but you will protect um, something. So that's, that's a good reason to do it. Um, along those lines, you should know that almost all cases are, not, are what's called no asset cases, meaning almost everybody finds a way to exempt their assets. Part of that is the exemptions. The federal exemptions are pretty flexible. There's something called a wild card that can be applied anywhere you want it. Um, so what, what'll happen is most of the cases, the trustee will do a diligent inquiry, find that there's nothing to divvy up for the creditors, and then the case will be over. Um, and those are the cases where the trustee is just getting the $60. If there are assets to be distributed, the trustee gets paid a percentage of whatever the trustee recovers. So that's kind of the incentive for the trustee to really dig and to say, did you really disclose everything here? Okay, did, you know, do, the, do the work that the trustee needs to do. Because in a case where there are assets, the trustee gets compensated for it. So that's the first reason, if the state exemptions aren't enough. Second one is if there's an emergency. Now, the bankruptcy creates an automatic stay, is the technical term for it. What that really means is it says stop to any action that's taken against the debtor or the debtor's property to collect on a pre-petition, you know, pre-bankruptcy debt. So if they are being, if there's collection action going against the person, a bankruptcy will stop it. When I say it helps in an emergency, it's not a long-term solution. It doesn't necessarily solve the underlying problem. We'll talk about whether there are times when it does, but there's a use of the bankruptcy to stop a collection activity. Um, if there's a foreclosure sale tomorrow, a bankruptcy today stops that sale. Um, if there is collection, if there's a garnishment against your bank account or against, and you're gonna, or against your paychecks, um, the filing the bankruptcy will stop that um, that action. Very valuable to um, somebody who's in an emergency situation. So that's an, another reason to do it. Now, if um, and the, the the last one is really the what we'll talk about to be whether it's a long-term solution, is the fresh start. So what a bankruptcy gives you, a Chapter 7 bankruptcy gives you, is a fresh start. It erases most, and we'll talk about which ones it doesn't, but it erases most personal liability for your debts. There are several things that it doesn't do. So here's, so a dis, in, in general terms, a discharge means you can't, the person can't collect your personal liability on, on a debt. But here are things that it doesn't do. It doesn't take care of claims against property, generally. So by that I mean a lien. That's the, the legal word for it. And that's somebody else's interest in your property. So, and it can be real property, and the quintessential case there is a mortgage. So you take out a mortgage, the bank gets an interest in your property that entitles it to put it up for sale if you don't pay foreclose to go through this process either through the courts or through a statutory process to force the sale of that property to get its to get paid so it has an interest in your property there are other ways there are other liens out there your car another one where it's a consensual one where you specifically say okay I give you uh, an interest in my car if you'll give me the money to go buy it 
that's the deal you strike, that's the paper you sign, they have a lien on your car and they can repossess the car, do that same process to get repaid if you don't live up to your end of the bargain. There are other ones that aren't consensual, so tax liens. If you don't pay your taxes, the government gets a lien on all your property. Again, it's just an interest in the property that protects them and helps secure whatever obligation you have. Another one would be a mechanic's lien or a workman's lien. This is if you're, somebody does work on your house or work on your car. They actually get an interest in your property equal to what they put into it. It arises automatically. Someone comes out and fixes your gutters. As long as they comply with the statutory procedure of giving notice and whatnot, they have an interest in your house. That, so if you don't pay, they have an interest there. So these are all reason, ways that people can get interests in your property. And those generally aren't affected by a Chapter 7 case. It's your personal liability for it that is. So let's think about that. In a Chapter 7 case, if you have a car that's subject to a lien, what are your options? Well, in fact, Congress has thought about that for you and has required you to fill out a statement of intention when you enter the case. One of the forms you have to do is say what you intend to do with your secured debts. Well, your options um, are you can surrender the property, give the property to the person who has a security interest in it. Uh, in certain circumstances, you can redeem it, meaning pay them the value of the property to get it. Um, and then the other one that is often done would be a reaffirmation. So that's saying, okay, I will live up to that. I could get out of my personal liability on this debt, but I'm not going to because I want to be able to keep this property. And so then you reaffirm it. Now think about that. Reaffirming a debt takes it outside of the usual discharge that would happen. And because it's kind of defeating the very purpose of why somebody filed for bankruptcy in the first place, it's highly regulated. There's a, a section of the bankruptcy code that deals extensively with how these happen. You have to go into court and show um, that it's not going to be an undue burden for you to be able to pay the amount that you're reaffirming. Um, and it's actually, as a practical matter, a good um, juncture to renegotiate with the creditor because what's your leverage? Oh, okay, I'll give you back the car and I'll have no personal liability. If the car is worth $8,000 and you owe twelve, dollars which is really easy to do when you're paying slower than the appreciation of the car is happening, or you roll over one loan into the next, um, there's no, it doesn't make any sense to reaffirm to pay $12,000 when your car is only worth eight. So your options, well, you give the car back, you tell the lender, okay, I'll pay you some portion of that, and you renegotiate the deal. This brings us to why a Chapter 13 might be a better route sometimes. A Chapter 13 has extra powers when it comes to secured claims. So one of the things a Chapter 7 discharge doesn't do is deal, doesn't get rid of liens. In a Chapter 13, you have the ability to restructure these to kind of recalibrate the amount that's due down to what the property is worth. So in that situation where you have $12,000 you owe on the car that's worth eight, you can, re, you can, it's called bifurcating it, you split it. Split it into two parts. You have one that's the, equal to the amount that the collateral's worth, and anything extra is treated as an unsecured claim like your credit card. And that gets dealt with in your plan and gets paid whatever you can pay it. And you only have to, you're only left with the, the lesser part for the car. You can't do that with your home. There's a specific provision that doesn't allow you to, to, to renegotiate that on your principal residence. Um, but that's one power. So if somebody comes and says, I need to save my car, or I need to save, so that's, that's what's driving this. Um, a Chapter 13 is a, is a potential way to deal with that. Another thing that a Chapter 7, so getting back to our what a Chapter 7 um, case, why you would do it. Remember why you do it? Exemptions aren't enough. You have an emergency. Or here, um, we're talking about you need a fresh start. Um, what it doesn't do is 
deal with the liens. What it doesn't do is give you good credit. You're not going to just get good credit by filing a bankruptcy. It does give you a tool to start rebuilding, though. Because if you're burdened with a monthly minimum payment on your credit card that doesn't allow you to ever catch up, by doing a bankruptcy and getting rid of that unsecured debt, you can start to be current. But it doesn't give you good credit by itself. It also doesn't create income for you. You don't start getting a check in the mail because you filed for bankruptcy. <laughs> it does, and so then think about that. It's structurally, it doesn't, if you're spending more than you make, you're gonna be spending more than you make after you file a bankruptcy too. So if that's the problem, if the real issue is an imbalance in the budget, the bankruptcy won't fix that, and the bankruptcy will make it worse because you get a bankruptcy discharge, you can't get another for eight years. So is this, James, is this why um, the current bankruptcy code requires that if you're going through bankruptcy, you get financial counseling, that you have to go through a process that where you talk to a, um, some professional about how to, re how, to, how to be a good money manager? Exactly. So there's the credit counseling on the front end, and after you're in the case, you have to do a financial management course before you get your discharge. And that's exactly right to prevent falling into it again and again. Yeah? How long could, um, after filing bankruptcy, um, impede anything like taking out a loan or buying it's on a your, home? It's on car. your credit report for 10 years. 10 years, yeah. okay. Um, but think about the alternative. You haven't been paying, somebody hasn't been paying their credit card. That's on your credit report. So it's the, what, whatever drove you into bankruptcy would have been there anyway. Um, so yes, it's on your credit report, but it does allow you to start rebuilding. Okay, but after how long? So, for example, if someone you know needed to take out some sort of financial, um, they had a financial need mm -hmm. um, because their credit wasn't well enough for, let's say, a bank to take them on. Mm -hmm. I mean, up, up until I don't know the, the ten years is the the point, or just as long as they do other things to try to build credit. I mean, how do you build credit if you don't have credit because it was tarnished? Sure. Yeah, that's a great question, and it's a little bit of a catch-22 of if you don't have good credit, how are you going to get good credit? Um, but think about what credit, good credit means. It means that you're a good risk for someone to lend you money. If you're a person who um, got, into, got into the soup, let's call it, well, maybe you don't want people to lend you money right now. There's maybe a good reason not to... to just because there's money out there to lend doesn't mean you need it. So it, it, it forces people to restructure the balance to be appropriate. That doesn't solve the problem of if you need to buy a car um, and you need, to, or you need housing or, or this or that. And there's, credit is used in a lot of ways. People look at it um, in a lot of different ways. Um, and there are different strategies for rebuilding credit. Uh, it's not my expertise, but what I've heard people talk about are things like um, using a secured credit card. So that's where, for example, you have a, a credit card with your bank. So let's say you have 500 bucks in the bank account. You can use your credit card up to that amount. And the reason there is the bank's protected itself so that if you don't pay, it can go get it from your account. But on paper, it's a credit card. And you start to show regular monthly payments that you're not behind on. And that's a way some people can rebuild their credit. Also found that a lot of clients after a bankruptcy get flooded with credit requests. Think about why. Because they can't file bankruptcy for eight years. Okay, maybe they're gonna be slow in paying or this or that, but these are predators. I mean, you're gonna start racking up fees. If you're, if you're, if you're the type of person who's late, they love you. <laughs> so as long as, they, as long as there's a way to keep it going, and if you filed for bankruptcy, you're, you're out of luck for a while. So I try, I try to counsel people away from being in love with credit to begin with. And then second, helping understand that there are ways to manage having less credit um, and still doing the things that we feel like we need to do in our life. But some of this is also about hard choices for people. With your scenario about people who structurally, yep. you know, have more expenses per month, 
for X or Y reason and, you know, limited, you know, income that's only you can't change, um, those people have to make decisions about moving to a mm -hmm. place that's less expensive, right? Getting rid of the car that has the big car payment so you're not driving, you know, the Subaru anymore. Oh, wait a minute, you probably drive the Subaru. So you're not driving a Cadillac anymore, you go to the Subaru, you know, that type of thing, right? <laughs> that's right, yep. So, um, and that's hard for people. Um, one other thing that, uh, and so I, I'm sorry, this is all, this is a downer, isn't it? <laughs> this is a Friday afternoon, we should be having fun. <laughs> not only am I talking about bankruptcy, but I'm talking about how horrible it is and why it doesn't get you what you want. <laughs> So I'm going to do it again. This is another thing bankruptcy doesn't do. <laughs> um, it doesn't get rid of non-dischargeable debts. Funny that they call it that. Well, um, there are certain debts that you can't get rid of in bankruptcy. You should be aware of these. Why? Yeah. Student loans. You got it. Yeah. Um, why, why do you know that? <laughs> so there are certain debts that if this is the reason the person is in trouble, a bankruptcy is not going to help. So that's an important thing to be able to spot because we want to know what. We want to know what bankruptcy can help and we want to know what bankruptcy isn't useful for because you don't want to go through it if it's not going to fix your problem. Well, here are a couple of big lists of, of the non-dischargeable debts. Student loans with an exception. So student loans, unless you can show that it, pros, it poses an undue burden on you or your dependents. That's been hard to show. You have to bring a lawsuit in the bankruptcy court to prove that. Um, case law has not been particularly favorable to the debtors. Uh, and in part, it's because under the federal scheme, they're really generous. As in, they'll extend things out a long way. They'll um, structure payments to be just a percentage of your income. Um, they'll work a lot with you, give you deferrals for hardships and for short periods, things like that. And so the courts have looked at that. And it's kind of an unfortunate outcome of how well the pro program is structured. They say, well, that works pretty well. It doesn't, pro it doesn't pose an undue burden to you to, to have to live with this for longer. But in some, in some circumstances, you can get out of the, the student loans. That's been a big hot topic in Congress. Um, there's been legislation up often to try to get that changed. But one of the big reasons why it's not is because the, these are government loans or government sponsored or even the private lenders get some government subsidy to it. So, uh, which leads me to the next big category, which is taxes. Generally, taxes are not dischargeable. Who makes the bankruptcy law? The government. The government takes care of its own and generally, taxes are not dischargeable. Um, another one is fraud-related claims. This one probably doesn't pop up a lot, except in one scenario. If a person ran up a lot of bills right before bankruptcy, that triggers something. So these credit card companies use sophisticated software just to, because they can't look at all these accounts, to look at your purchases. So whenever there's a bankruptcy case filed, they'll run it through the software to figure out if there's a pattern to your purchases, and oh, there's a spike right before the bankruptcy. Um, that triggers a review, and there was a change in the law in 2005 that makes it easier for them to prove that you intended to defraud them. So the idea is if you incurred this debt knowing you weren't going to pay it back, that's a fraud type debt that can't be discharged. So um, something to caution people about, or, or if, you've, if you hear in the calls that they're um, I'm not even sure how you, how you approach it, but it's, uh, it's a bad idea to run up the debt when you know you're not going to pay it because the fraud type claims are not dischargeable. Um, last one to talk about are domestic support obligations, child support or um, obligations that come out of a divorce decree, support obligations like that are not dischargeable. So yeah. people, correct, yep. So those are, and, um, and we can think why. I mean, in the case of taxes, well, the government, we can cynically say the government's making, taking care of itself. Well, in the case of domestic support obligations, that's protecting vulnerable people. So um, there are some here that are really good. There are also really silly ones. Um, 
in my opinion. It's just it's one of these statutes that Congress has continued to add things to. Oh wait, I think this one should be non-dischargeable. Oh wait, I think this one too. Well, if you cause a car crash because you were driving drunk, then it's the damages that are caused by that are not dischargeable. Um, in my opinion, we're getting much too fine-grained to think about every little thing somebody could do and decide whether that particular thing is dischargeable or not. And it makes it complicated because then you have a statute that's, you know, this section is four pages long to figure out, you know, are, are there any particular exceptions. But the big ones are ones we talked about. So that's another thing that a bankruptcy doesn't do. Okay, so a Chapter 13. I've missed one really important thing about a Chapter 13 and talking with you about it so far. And that is one of the basic requirements for being in a Chapter 13 is you have to have regular income. You're only eligible to be in Chapter 13 if you have regular income. Let's think about that. Why would that be? Because you have to fund a plan. When you go into a Chapter 13, you keep your knapsack on your back. You don't have to dump it out. Um, you have to tell people what's in it, but you don't have to dump it out. Um, but you do have to put on the table a plan to repay over the next three to five years. You don't have to repay everything. You have to stay current on your secured debts. And with your unsecured debts, they get to split your disposable income. So you have to, your plan charts that out. It says what your disposable income is and, and how it's going to be paid. You'll then pay that over to a trustee. Trustee acts in a different capacity than in the Chapter 7. They administer the plan by distributing that money to the right people. But you can only be in it if you have regular income to contribute. Because if you don't contribute to your plan, you get a plan confirmed by the court, it's in, in effect for three to five years. If you don't contribute to it, you don't get your discharge. You only get your discharge at the end of the process in a Chapter 13, three to five years down the road. So, yeah. And how do they determine what's disposable income? Like you wouldn't even have money to get like a cup of coffee? Like what percentage? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's, yeah, and it's, it's a complicated process to do. And the statute sets forth different things that you get a lot. You can essentially think about it as getting allowances. And you can live within a certain means of, of what are reasonable expenses. And you'll build that into your plan. And if one of your creditors disagrees, they can object to the plan and say, no, you have more disposable income than that. And then it can get, then it, the court will determine what your disposable income is. But you'd likely have a coffee, uh, you know, amount, amount for food. You know, uh, you know, this is what I need for, for rent. This is what I need for expenses, you know, those types of things. Yep. So that gets built in. Um, How yeah. does it determine the length of the plan? I always hear people say, it's a three to five year plan. Is there a formula or how is that determined? Yeah, it's, it's actually generally a five year plan. Um, and one of the things you have to do is you have to contribute an amount that's at least equal to what, you're, to what they would have gotten in a Chapter 7 case. So that's kind of a, a yardstick that you measure any, any Chapter 13 against. So it's the best interest of creditors test where you have to be able to, and all right, let's put it this way. Uh, let's say baseline a bankruptcy is a Chapter 7. I think that's true, but just humor me on that. Your baseline is you walk in with your knapsack, you put it on the table. Okay, these things are not exempt. You distribute them to your creditors. And then somebody comes up with a genius idea to say, Oh, I just put all my stuff on the table. Um, trustee, here's all this. Creditors, you're going to get this. Oh, but wait. I tell you what, let's make a deal. If you let me keep this stuff, I promise to pay you more than it's worth over the next three to five years. Take me up on it. And they say, hmm, I like that because I'm going to get more than I'll get if I just force you to liquidate right now. But how do I know you're going to do it? Well, okay, we'll do this. I'll do that, but you'll only get your discharge if you complete the plan. Deal. That's a chapter 13. So you've, you have to pay more than what you're gonna, um, the creditors would have gotten in a chapter seven. And it'll depend on how much you can pay each month, you know, how much you're contributing toward, toward, your, uh, toward your plan. And if they don't think that you can do a 13, then the court will force you into a chapter seven, is that yeah, right? Yeah, that's right, or dismiss the case. So the idea is you have to prove in a chapter 13 that the plan is feasible, 
you didn't have the regular income, it obviously wouldn't be feasible. So they've, they've weeded you out to begin with because you're only eligible if you have regular income. But if for some reason what you've proposed isn't feasible, um, then the court won't confirm the plan to begin with and you won't get off the ground. Okay, so I see time-wise we've gotten over the hour and I really want to make sure that we talk about two more things. And we're going to combine them to be... Hold on just a second, James. He's got me Dan, right on there. Gonna, do you need to move, Dan? Hold on just a second. Yeah, please. Sorry. <laughs> Right now, I've, I've made a big square, or no, a big cross. Okay. I'll, I'll do the interpretation for you. <laughs> okay, so here is Kristen, how... Kristen, if you need to get on the other side to see, okay. by all okay. means. Okay. So here is a, a quick and dirty way to analyze a case to figure out a couple things. What kind of good referral to make, and then just to understand the person's situation to make sure you're asking the right questions. We're going to use Zoe on here. But first, let me tell you what I'm doing. I make four boxes, and I say, all right, what are assets? What are liabilities? What's income? And what are expenses? This is going to show us some really key points about whether a bankruptcy is helpful, and whether there are other solutions that could be out there, other referrals to make. OK, so you'll put things like assets. Do we know about Zoe's assets? Let's, uh, for the sake of the audience watching yeah. the video, because they do not have the Zoe problem, can we just run through the problem Please. real quick? Please, yeah. Somebody who's got it in front of them, tell me the salient facts. How about I'll do that to make it uh, easy. Zoe is a character who is a middle-aged woman with two teenage daughters who happened to become involved in a car accident um, as she was driving to the post office with her insurance check, uh, car insurance check uh, in hand. She ended up having um, an accident with a truck from the good, a good to the last bite food truck at an intersection which resulted in uh, $60,000 worth of damage to the food truck. Zoe was unfortunately injured in the accident. She ended up in the, um, um, the intensive care unit, um, and, uh, but uh, suffered and suffered um, a very serious injury to her arm, which required multiple surgeries. In the end, Zoe started receiving bills, $60,000 for the food truck, um, and then over $300,000 uh, for medical bills. And uh, the question is, she calls United Way uh, 211 to say, I, I need to uh, get some information about bankruptcy and credit uh, counseling. So that, those are your basic facts. She makes uh, $33,600 per year working at the Acme Book Company as um, an assistant editor. She also receives some child support per month. Um, throw it um, $800 a month on there, approximately. That's when her husband is timely on his payments, which he's not always. Hmm. She lives in an apartment, so she does not have a home. And her primary asset was a 97 Dodge. Oh, and that was totaled. Right, but let's yeah. assume it, yeah. there's some value to it. Junk value. Yeah. So then she likely also has household goods, so she can furnish her apartment. Yes. Um, OK. In and, so, a, and she pays rent. So. Yeah. In an interview scenario where the attorney is doing this, um, we'll, we'll kind of it would be much more detailed where you'd be getting much more information. But the quick and dirty way to think about this is, first, what did we talk about what a bankruptcy doesn't do? Doesn't fix a problem of the budget. That's the bottom half here. Is there an imbalance between income and expenses? We don't know her expenses, but we're going to assume that she's gotten up to this point. We don't know of any 
debt problem she has. She hasn't been running up credit cards. We're going to assume that this is about balanced. She's a thrifty person. Thrifty I can person. Tell you. Okay. So first thing would be okay. Is the structure? Is there a structural problem that got us here? No. That's good. We're already past the first door. So structural problem should, is not the issue. If she does have a bankruptcy, then she would be um, going forward, not digging herself into a hole. Income, well below the median. So we're thinking, um, okay, probably eligible for Chapter 7, probably the kind of thing that would be good to refer to VLN for assistance with a bankruptcy, so far is where we are. Assets, um, two things to think about. Okay, first is, are there assets that would be lost in a bankruptcy? That might be a reason not to do it. We talked about if you're judgment-proof, then you, that may be, or we talked about how having not very many assets um, protects you from uh, judgments and whatnot. If you have extra assets, you're going to lose them in bankruptcy. You might lose them outside of bankruptcy too, depending on how the collection, you know, as collection activities progress. But a bankruptcy, you're walking in and affirmatively putting them on the table. Okay. This, the amount of assets that we're aware of right now, um, would clearly fall within exemptions. So it would not, walking into bankruptcy, the price of putting your knapsack on the table, she wouldn't lose her assets. And yet, she would protect her future income, which right now is likely garnishable. If one of these creditors went through the process to get a judgment and then start the collection process, this amount is over the threshold for being garnished. And we don't, we're not aware of her receiving public assistance so that she could exempt her wages. It's at risk. Something needs to be protected. And a, doing the bankruptcy protects your future income in a Chapter 7. So here, that's a star. That's a, this is a, probably a, a reason to file. Um, not risking anything here, that would be a reason not to file. Getting over into liabilities, are there any here? Remember we said what, what doesn't a bankruptcy do? It doesn't affect liens. So are any of these tied to a particular asset? Like if there were a car, it's tied to a particular loan. You're only going to get rid of one if you get rid of the other is kind of the way to think about it. No, these are not tied to any particular assets. Okay, what about non-dischargeability claims? Taxes, child support, student loans. No, none of these are the types of debts that um, get pulled from the process. So these are exactly the kind of debts that a Chapter 7 works well with. One-time occurrences that aren't the result of a structural problem, that really just swamp a person and threaten to overwhelm them for the rest of their life because they, she'll never get out of that unless she gets the benefit of a fresh start and can go back to the rest of her life here. So this is a quick way to think about, it helps weed out the problems and helps direct uh, our attention in the right spots. And this is, a, I think, a good case for referring to a, you know, a VLN to do, um, hopefully a, a, refer it to an attorney to do a Chapter 7 is probably where it, where it would start. And the process obviously gets more detailed as more information comes in. Um, one other point is when you're uh, this was just an interesting side point that uh, somebody yesterday raised, but is probably worth talking about as well, is that part of what you have to disclose when you are doing the um, schedules and statement of financial affairs are payments you've made to creditors, gifts and transfers you've made, because the one of, some of the things the trustee can get is the trustee can claw back certain payments that you've made. Um, and that's, we talked about a little bit at the beginning of the fraudulent transfers. Um, even if it's not a fraudulent thing, if it's just paying back your mom, your, your mom lent you a thousand bucks, you really don't want to, you know, you really want to pay her back. Well, if that was within a year before you filed for bankruptcy, the trustee can get that back and use that as a non-exempt asset to distribute to creditors. So there are plenty of pitfalls for people in this disclosure process and the counseling process where um, we've talked about there being pro se people will file without a lawyer 
and lots of people do. Um, but um, it, it's, a, it's a, a difficult process that takes a, a lot of legal judgment. Um, and so really, if you can refer to people to sources that can get legal help or at least legal advice through some of the, the um, advice hotlines or the bankruptcy uh, advice clinics at the courthouses, it would be really helpful. Other uh, last questions for me? Well, James, I wanted to ask if, if we just change that scenario a little bit with Zoe and instead of her just being in a hurry to the post office and running through a red light and running into the food truck, if she had been drinking and was convicted of drunk driving, mm -hmm. then she would not be able to go for bankruptcy be for those liabilities. Well, the medical, the medical bills would be different. To, so, but for the damage she caused, then, then that debt would be not dischargeable. She, wouldn't, yep. she couldn't discharge the damage to the food truck, but she could still discharge the medical debt. That's, I think bills. so, yeah. Yep. Okay, all right, well, great. Well, um, we'll come back and thank James in a second for his, his talk. Let me just fill in a couple of things from our training material and uh, just to make a couple of uh, significant points here. First of all, um, uh, this uh, chart about Zoe that James has done is extremely helpful. However, of course, we're not going to be able to do that on the telephone, and we don't want you doing that. But it's for illustrative purposes, just to get a, to get an idea of really when somebody calls, you know, what what it is in terms of how bankruptcy works. Um, uh, given um, the 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 number of people that file for bankruptcy every year, um, there are there are a relatively limited number of bankruptcy lawyers in the state. Is that right, James? I mean, are there more than 500 of you, do you think? Probably not. Okay. So given that, we have very limited resources. And, and what um, one of the key points about our training here on bankruptcy is that bankruptcy is a very specialized area of the law, very specialized, probably more specialized than any of the other areas that we've done training on. Um, and because it is so complicated. And, and so the, the chances of everyone being able to get a lawyer to help them with their bankruptcy are zero. So it is going to be a, a weeding out process. Um, we have um, on page, uh, page six, you'll see we start, and well, actually on page five of the training material, we start listing some of the resources here. And the, 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 the two things that um, I think are primary is you're going to get calls from people who are going to be in panic, again, because suddenly they're realizing that their financial lives are going to change dramatically. And I think that it's important that you be able to give them a referral to a couple of places where they at least can go get some kind of advice from a lawyer initially. Um, I, um, the bankruptcy court generally, um, uh, and, and I know James will weigh in on this, but the bankruptcy court generally um, has, a federal bankruptcy court, if you go to their website, does have a page for pro se filers, for people who are going through the system alone. And it is a, it is a process of trying to explain to them how the system works. Um, uh, I know that, um, as James reported yesterday, and please weigh in, um, it's a, di a difficult process for anybody to wade through, particularly on Chapter 13. That's yeah. impossible, maybe, for a pro se filer. And Chapter 7 is difficult enough. Is that right? That's right. Okay. But so there are resources on the, uh, especially the, the court's own website. So that's a, a good place for people to get information. Um, there are also links to um, the court system on the national level have some instructional videos um, that kind of walk through the different steps so that people can watch those you know even before they go have you know an advice at one of these advice clinics so that they understand the lingo and they understand kind of what the potential questions are right and so if we're if we're concentrating on videos there are videos at the court website that that they can find on that page um, lawhelpmn.org has, vid has videos. Now, if, uh, if somebody calls up the Law Help page, 
it comes under, cons there is a consumer debt, um, you know, category. It does not list bankruptcy. So your caller will have to type in bankruptcy into the search field, and then all kinds of resources come up for bankruptcy, including about the third thing down, a video. And we now have the video that you can refer to them at the Call for Justice website that uh, we'll, we'll have from today. But to talk to a real lawyer, to remember those, those resources are just you know, to get information, but to talk to a lawyer, we've listed on page five the bankruptcy uh, advice clinics for people that are 300% of federal poverty guidelines or below, that would be families, as well as item three, the telephone advice uh, that Volunteer Lawyers Network will provide. And this is something we were hearing when Martha Delaney came and talked from the VLN. Remember she was talking about the lawsuit answering service that they were providing for telephone advice, the same concept. Across the state, they will hook somebody up uh, to be able to talk to a lawyer about bankruptcy via the telephone. Again, that's 300% of federal poverty guideline. Um, for people who need full representation, VLN provides about 60 cases a year. So it's extremely, extremely limited in terms of somebody's ability to get full representation. It is going to be, for people who are going through bankruptcy, it is going to be, again, a hit or miss. You're going to have to be your own advocate. They're going to have to go to, go to clinics, and they may need to go multiple times on different dates and talk to maybe multiple different lawyers to help them get through the process of bankruptcy. But what is the alternative? The alternative is not understanding the process. So it does take for people being their own advocates and working uh, to, to get things done. On page um, uh, seven, you see where we talk about uh, a legal or a call for justice inside tip. Um, remember, we have the legal access point clinic in Hennepin County for Hennepin County residents. And um, uh, that clinic is staffed by lawyers from all walks of life, corporate lawyers, trial lawyers, lawyers who do immigration law, and lawyers who do bankruptcy. If somebody has a bankruptcy matter and they want to talk to a bankruptcy lawyer, if they call um, the, uh, the Hennepin County Bar Association Legal Referral Information Services line at 612-752-6666, and ask, when will the bankruptcy lawyers be staffing the Legal Access Point Clinic? That they will tell them that the HCBA um, referral person will give them the times and dates when the bankruptcy lawyers will be present. So somebody could actually go to the LAP clinic looking to talk to a bankruptcy lawyer and be able to do that. And remember the value of that LAP clinic when it is staffed by Hennepin County Bar Association lawyers is that there are no income restrictions. When it's staffed by VLN lawyers, there are restrictions on income, but when it's staffed by HCBA lawyers, there are no income restrictions. So that's your little uh, tip from Call for Justice today. Um, uh, James, have I left anything out, do you think, um, sort of in terms of cleanup? No, I don't think so. Okay. Um, well, I'll, question. yes. If somebody um, is going for through foreclosure, is this kind of getting into the bankruptcy and all of that, or are those two different things, or do you take a look at? Yeah, so remember how one of the options, or one of the reasons a bankruptcy can be helpful is to stop in an emergency. Um, and so it can help um, slow down that process so that the person can figure out what the long-term solution is. Okay. Um, a Chapter 13 can do some limited restructuring of the home mortgage. So for example, they have to be able to stay current and under their plan going forward, mm -hmm. but their past amounts that they were behind on can be paid over time going forward. So a Chapter 13 can be used to save a house in the right scenario. So if you hear somebody calling saying, I need help saving my house, um, a Chapter 7 is not going to do that. It'll delay things, mm -hmm. um, but it won't help save it. But a 13 has the potential to. So if somebody calls and says, I you know, want to try and save my house, 
um, an appropriate referral would be to, the, to a bankruptcy lawyer. So they go talk to somebody at one of the clinics and, and get some advice on how to protect themselves. Yeah. So, yes, Mary. I thought I heard on the news either this morning or last night that Congress is uh, getting ready to double the interest rate on student loans. Hmm. So they're going to be double what wow. they're used to. So. Well, now you really ruined my Friday. That's for future loans. Uh. I, think, I think there's going to be some callers out there lost. Hmm. It ha it, I mean, it, the, the fat lady didn't sing, yeah. they were, but it's on the table and there's a decision coming down. Well, so a lot of people's... And that's not discharge, or that's dischargeable. So not usually dischargeable. Yeah, yep. so what's... Well, it's going to be more expensive to go to school. Usually those programs well, those lock... Stats. Yeah. are fixing the double and people can't pay them. Usually student loans are not variable interest rate. So you right. usually no, I know that. But yeah. So if you've already got a student loan, the rate's set. It's for the new student. Lo I'm assuming I haven't. Yeah, read the it is for the oh, be for the new stuff yeah. coming out. I did not catch that piece. Yeah. You I usually that. mine at least are. Fixed. Yeah, Mary. If you already have ten thousand dollars in student loan at three point two percent, it it stays there. It's not gonna like overnight go to six point four percent. It's if you go back to school and you take out more loans, now they're at a double rate. Okay, but you raise an interesting question, which is really about what may be, may be the next bubble, may be the next crisis that our country has, but we don't need to talk about that here at, at our training session. But see me off camera. Okay, <laughs> does anybody else have any other ca uh, questions? Well, James, thank you so very much for your great presentation. And that brings us to a close for another training session for 211. Thank you.